everyone, this week we are talking The River from Flannery O'Connor. Let's dive in. Uh, it'll be a little bit different this week. It won't be quite as linear. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to go through kind of just a very brief summary of the story and what happened in it, and then go through some analysis and some kind of key quotes that I thought were important. And once again, as always, my caveat, this is just my take. So if you're reading these things and you're experiencing interpreting something completely different, by all means, that's fine. I think something that's important whenever we're doing analysis like this and answering questions in a prompt that you might be assigned, like for my class, is understanding that you as the reader have weight in this conversation. So uh, ultimately, anytime you're reading a story or reading a book, it's a conversation between writer and reader. But I think historically we've put way too much emphasis on what the writer thinks and what the writer believes. And uh, I think oftentimes that kind of leaves us as readers in a position to where we're just trying to figure out what the author is doing instead of asking, well, what's this doing to me as the reader? And, and keep in mind from what we know and studied about Flannery O'Connor's background that she's a deeply devout Catholic. And that might not align with your beliefs. So your interpretation, your reactions, the way you encounter the story are probably going to be really different than the way Flannery O'Connor thought about it in the 1950s. You might have problems with the story, and that's great. I think it's really awesome to kind of understand where writers were coming from within their own personal context and identities and seeing how that impacts with our own identities in kind of a modern reading. Okay, so The River. We know that the primary character in the river, his name is Harry Ashfield. He's probably around four or five years old. Uh, and we know that he's in a pretty rough situation. He's got a mom who is a drunk, a dad who is neglecting him. He's just overall not in a good scenario here. And even we see that with his name, like Harry Ashfield. We see later on in the story that he's dumping ashes on the ground to make it look like uh, they just fell over. And we see that he's panicked, he's scared. He's just not in a good situation at all. And giving him a name like Ashfield kind of connotes the sense that he's not in the best place, right? So we know that he's brought to this revivalist uh, Christian meeting by Mrs. Conan, who's this babysitter, and she believes in faith healing. She's brought him to this pastor whose name is Bevel Summers. And for some reason, Harry, the kid, he weirdly tells Mrs. Conan that his name is also Bevel. And so throughout the story, we hear his name not as Harry, but as Bevel, even though his name is Harry. Kind of strange. So at the meeting, Bevel, the younger, the kid, he's baptized in the river. And he's told by this pastor, Bevel Summers, that now he's been baptized and presumably has been made into this Christian, that his life counts. The implication there being that prior to the baptism that his life did not count. Now, we see this kind of baptism and these traditional ideas of new life in Christian understanding through the eyes of a four or five year old kid who doesn't have familiarity with Christianity. So when this pastor tells him that he's going to receive this new life, that his life is going to count, you can imagine Bevel's disappointment, younger Bevel's disappointment, when he goes home and his family still neglects and ignores him. He's still going through the same process of being in a really tough situation, being around people who don't care for him, who aren't looking out for him. So essentially what happens is, is that Bevel, he wants the same feeling he had when he was baptized by this pastor. So he decides to return to the river and baptize himself so he can get that experience of feeling like he counts again because in his immediate world the real world he doesn't have that sensation he doesn't feel like he actually counts so he's going to the river to do it so uh, on his way to the river to baptize himself mr paradise sees him and mr paradise if you remember he is the heckler that's there at kind of the first revivalist meeting so um, contrary to his name, which kind of conjures up the sense of heaven or the Garden of Eden, Mr. Paradise stands in as like this figure of skepticism and rationalism. And if you remember back to our readings and our documentary viewings of Flannery O'Connor, 
Flannery O'Connor was often writing in response to these types of people, skeptics, people who saw themselves as rationalists, materialists. She's responding in her stories to these types of people, almost like a defense of faith to that type of argument. So Mr. Paradise, this heckler who kind of goes after the pastor, Mr. Bevel, he sees the young Bevel, Harry, going to this river. He sees Harry, the younger Bevel, jump into the river. Now from his perspective, I imagine this is probably looking like some kind of suicide or death wish. Uh, but what we know is that Bevel is trying to baptize himself again to get the sensation that he counts. So Mr. Paradise dives in after the younger Bevel, attempting to save him, but he can't do it. He doesn't save Bevel. The implication, at least from my interpretation, is that Bevel dies. He dies in this river. And there's all sorts of weird complications with this story. Something that's really interesting about this story is that it's pretty controversial, right? So there's all sorts of uh, different takes that people have on the story. People don't like the story because they're confused as to why Bevel had to die. Uh, Flannery O'Connor even defended the death of Bevel at one point. And in Catholic tradition and ideology, he was beneath what was called the age of accountability. So he was under the age of seven, which was kind of this arbitrary number the church put on children. And the idea was, well, if you died before that age, then you just go to heaven because you can't be held accountable for your sins, right? So in her defense, Bevel goes to heaven because of his age and he's escaping the horrible world that he's in with his parents, which as a modern reader, it feels troublesome, right? It feels troublesome that the escape from the terrible situation is to like die and go to heaven, right? Especially in a culture that doesn't kind of see faith in the same light that maybe it once was in the 1950s, but also we don't like the idea of using death to escape life's hardships, or at least that's kind of my take on it. So I'm just going to highlight a few key points that I noticed in the text, and hopefully it'll kind of blend to your interpretation a little bit. But notice right when Mrs. Conan walks in the door, um, we hear this loud voice from the hallway that says, well, he ain't fixed right, talking about uh, Harry or Bevel. Well, then, cr uh, for Christ's sake, fix him, the father muttered. It's six o'clock in the morning. And there's already some kind of foreshadowing that's going on here from uh, Mrs. Conan's perspective, right? Like she is going to fix him for Christ's sake, right? So she already has these notions about how she's going to improve and fix this little boy when she takes him to this healing, this revivalist meeting that's at the river. And she's going because she's attracted to this preacher who doesn't get around a whole lot. So we know that she believes in spiritual healing. We know that she is a devoutly religious person. Mrs. Conan takes Bevel to her house where he meets these like young kids that trick him into letting these pigs out of the sty. And if you remember his interpretation of the pig, he says Bevel had never seen a real pig, uh, but he had seen a pig in a book and knew they were small, fat, pink animals with curly tails and round green faces and bow ties, which is endearing, right? Like a little kid's thinking that. He leaned forward and eagerly and pulled eagerly at the board, letting the pigs out. So then he has this jarring moment where uh, he had already done it. And another face, gray, wet, and sour, was pushing into his, knocking him down and back as it scraped out under the plank. So he's encountered these like nasty, sour, gray pigs in contrast to how he thought pigs were supposed to look. These cute little pink things with curly tails and bow ties. So we're seeing not only is Harry or Bevel coming from this really unhealthy situation with his family to where he's neglected, but even as a child, his view of the world, which should be one of innocence, is being rapidly stolen from him in the way that he's seeing the pigs, in the way that he's encountering adults. It's just not working out for him very well. And we also know that he has not really any context for who this Jesus person is that Mrs. Conan is talking about or that the older Mr. Bevel is talking about. We see that he sees this like picture that's in Mrs. Conan's house of the sky in a white robe with a halo over his head, working with wood, carpenters, so it's Jesus. And um, we get some more implications of how tough his life has been. It says that once he had been beaten up in the park by some strange boys when his sitter forgot him, which is so tragic, right? 
And then even his understanding of Jesus after he describes the painting, uh, he says, you found out more when you left where you lived. He had found out already this morning that he had been made by a carpenter named Jesus Christ. Before he had thought it had been a doctor named Sladewell, a fat man with a yellow mustache who gave him shots and thought his name was Herbert. But this must have been a joke. They joked a lot where he lived. If he had thought about it before, he would have thought Jesus Christ was a word like, oh, or damn, or God, or maybe somebody who cheated him out of something sometime. So no context for who this Jesus figure is. And once again, we're getting kind of the, the view of the world through the eyes of a four and five year old boy, right? So we have these euphemisms of saying like, well, Jesus made you. Well, okay, that's like a metaphor that you're using to explain something that you see as truth. However, when you're explaining this to a four and five year old, they don't have that context, right? So we see already kind of the first inklings here of Harry, young Bevel, interpreting these kind of spiritual truths as something that is very literal, right? And so when he winds up going to this revivalist meeting, this is what the older Bevel, the pastor, is saying to people. He's saying, like, look, if you came here for healing, if you came here for a show, you got to get out of here. This is not what I'm here for. Essentially, he's here to introduce people to Jesus. Then he lifted his head and arms and shouted, listen to what I got to say, you people. There ain't but one river, and that's the river of life made out of Jesus's blood. That's the river you have to lay your pain in, in the river of faith, in the river of life, in the river of love, in the rich red river of Jesus' blood, you people. Uh, his voice grew soft and musical. All the rivers come from that one river and go back to it like it was the ocean sea. And if you believe, you can lay your pain in that river and get rid of it because that's the river that was made to carry sin. It's a river full of pain itself pain itself, moving toward the kingdom of Christ to be washed away. Slow, you people, slow as this here old red water river round my feet. Okay, now think about this for a second. This is very spiritual talk. It's loaded with all sorts of metaphors, right? So the river that this older Mr. Bevel is talking about is a metaphor, right? So he's baptizing people in the river, which in Christian tradition is kind of rife with this idea that you're dying to your sins in your old way of life and you're being born anew when you come out of the water as a person who is following Christ. Now, put yourself in the mind of a four or five year old who isn't familiar with this religious language and is listening to this charismatic preacher talk, right? He's saying, put your pain in this river, it'll wash it away. In this river of Jesus's blood. And if you remember previously in the story, we know that this river is surrounding these kind of clay areas. So the river itself is red. So we're getting these kind of literal interpretations that are going on. You can imagine a four or five year old thinking like, oh, this river of blood, if I put my pain into it, it's going to wash it away and take me to the kingdom of God, which if you don't have context for it, if you don't understand it, you're thinking this is an actual physical place that I can go to where my sins, the bad things that I've done are going to be washed away and where my pain is going to be washed away. So you can see already these seeds kind of being set for the conclusion that's going on towards the end of the story. And that's precisely what happens, right? So um, the preacher says, if I baptize you, you'll be able to go to the kingdom of Christ. Think about that as a four and five year old interpreting it literally. You'll be washed in the river of suffering, son, and you'll go by the deep river of life. Do you want that? Yes, the child said and thought, I won't go back to the apartment then. I'll go under the river. So he's thinking of this kingdom of God as a literal, physical place that's going to take him away from his awful life. Okay? And so this is when he's baptized and the pastor is telling him, you count. But this kid and his interpretation of things, he's only thinking about his physical real world and not the spiritual life, the metaphor that this pastor is talking about, right? And we see this declaration that uh, Bevel, uh, young Harry is saying, he saw the pale oval close to him in the dark. He said, I'm not the same now, he muttered, I count. So he deeply believes that he has the sensation that he counts. Now, something I haven't touched on is that prior to this in the story, there's constantly imagery of skeletons. I don't know if you remember that, but um, 
you know, we have Mrs. Connan's children looking like a boat of skeletons and Harry looking like a skeleton, even Mrs. Connan looking like a skeleton. There's constantly all this imagery of death leading up to this moment. And I think for Flannery O'Connor, this is a very real act that happens here. There's this sense of like actual life that comes at the transition of kind of a spiritual awakening, right? Okay, um, so later on we have the scenes where Bevel, he's, he's jumping in the river. We see that he's incredibly, I mean that line about how he's not going to go back to the apartment is just heartbreaking, right? It's totally heartbreaking. Um, Mr. Paradise sees Bevel going toward the river and eventually jumping in it. This is the way the story concludes. Bevel didn't see him, Mr. Paradise, at all. He only saw the river, shimmering reddish-yellow, and bounded into it with his shoes and his coat and took a gulp. He swallowed some and spit the rest out, and then he stood there in water, up to his chest, and looked around him. The sky was a clear, pale blue, all in one piece except for the hole the sun made, and fringed around the bottom with treetops. His coat floated to the surface and surrounded him like a strange gay lily pad, and he stood grinning in the sun. So we already see that his disposition is something positive. He, he's thinking this is a really good thing that he's doing here. So despite the, the perspective that we're getting from Mr. Paradise, this is not like a kid trying to kill himself. He intended not to fool with preachers anymore, but to baptize himself and to keep on going this time until he found the kingdom of Christ in the river. He didn't mean to waste any more time. He put his head under the water at once and pushed forward. In a second, he began to gasp and sputter. His head reappeared in the surface. He started under again, and the same thing happened. The river wouldn't have him. He tried again and came up choking. This was the way it had been when the preacher held him under. He had to fight with something that pushed him back in the face. He stopped and thought suddenly, it's another joke, it's just another joke. He thought how far he had come for nothing, and he began to hit and splash and kick the filthy river. His feet were already treading on nothing. He gave one low cry of pain and indignation. Then he heard a shout and turned his head and saw something like a giant pig bounding after him, shaking a red and white club and shouting, which would have been uh, Mr. Conan. I'm, I'm, I'm sorry, Mr. Paradise, right? We know that Mr. Paradise... He has like this cancerous kind of tumor that's behind his ear. It's kind of distorting his appearance a lot. Um, and we, we hear later on or earlier on in the, in the story that he wasn't able to be healed, right? He didn't have the faith to be healed. So this is where uh, Harry is seeing Mr. Paradise approach him. He plunged under at once. The waiting current caught him like a long, gentle hand and pulled him swiftly forward and down. For an instant, he was overcome with surprise. Then, since he was moving quickly and knew that he was going somewhere, all his fury and fear left him. And the implication is he, he dies, right? And so here, it seems from Harry's perspective that this is like a happy ending, that he is moving toward, he's going towards something, the kingdom of Christ, the kingdom of God, and it's taking him away from the apartment, from this hellscape that he's lived in. And from his perspective, this is a good thing. As a reader, what do you think? Do you buy into this? Um, are you okay with Flannery O'Connor kind of using this Catholic theological idea of the age of accountability? Like no matter what happened, he's too young, he's going to heaven, he's escaping this hellscape that he's in. And even thinks that he's escaping this hellscape that he's in because of his interpretation of all these stories that the pastor has told him, right? And then we have this little kind of like coda at the very end of the story from Mr. Paradise's perspective. Mr. Paradise's head appeared from time to time on the surface of the water. Finally, far downstream, the old man rose like some ancient water monster and stood empty-handed, staring with his dull eyes as far down the river line as he could see. So Mr. Paradise, this figure who represents the skeptic, the rational person of the world, the, the materialist, He's not able to save Harry either. And I think by extension, the argument that um, O'Connor is making here is that skepticism isn't going to save you, right? Rationalism, materialism, scientific method isn't going to save you, right? The thing that's going to save you is going to be something that's going to feel crazy. It's going to feel wild. It's going to look like suicide relative to those people around you. And that's engaging in this spiritual life. And I think the poignancy... This is my take that 
O'Connor is going for here is that, you know, it, a life of faith does look like something that is extreme, that relative to how other people view you and see you, it looks crazy. Uh, and I imagine that's what Mr. Paradise thought. So, and, and we see this too in terms of the other stories we've read from O'Connor, that she puts a high premium on acting out your faith in ways that other people would find uncomfortable or seem weird or ways that don't quite keep up with appearances. But once again, as a modern reader, how do you take this? I mean, are you okay with how the story ends with Bevel dying and with O'Connor's interpretation of it being something positive? Uh, there's all sorts of ways, different ways you can look at this. And we can look at kind of the complexity of religion and say that, well, these metaphors are difficult to understand. And we've got to understand that when we tell people these, these images and ideas that are used as metaphors to explain spiritual truths, that oftentimes they take these ideas to the extreme and we develop extremists and extremists behave in ways that are unhealthy to others and to themselves. Or maybe you're a person that really does think that this is the best solution for Bevel, that he escapes this hellscape and really does encounter the kingdom of God in this, this river. So uh, all those questions flowing around. Once again, if you're unsure, that's okay. Just um, do your best to answer the prompts, use text evidence, ask questions, uh, chime in with me, connect with me through Canvas if you need any help. And I look forward to reading your responses.